Greetings, aspiring poker players. This is Characters, aka Pete. How's it going? Welcome back to the Carrot Poker Podcast. Um, we are continuing our foray into the Grinders Manual today, which is a few weeks away from completion. Um, well, you know, the girlfriend's leaving the country for a couple of weeks, so it's a pretty good excuse to actually just get get my head down and bash out the final few chapters worth of editing, you know, assemble a contents page, a glossary of terms, and then get the thing out there on the Amazon Kindle store where it's going to be available and probably also in audiobook format for those of you driving in your cars right now who can't really be bothered or don't have the free time maybe to spend reading a book. Um, you could just be listening to it right now on your way to work or way home or wherever it is that you happen to be going, probably the card room if you're poker players, right? So yeah, it should be out soon. Um, this is chapter 14 we're going to take a little plunge into today. I'm not actually going to do much other than simply go through a few pages today. I want you to get a real flavour for what the book is actually looking like rather than rant about too much stuff that's not in the book. So it's going to be a very sort of direct, we're going to start on page 498, we're going to go through to like page 502 or something like that. I'm going to just explain to you what's basically going on. Chapter 14 is all about playing deep and 14.1, which is the bit that we're going to be looking at ourselves here, is playing deep before, uh, playing deep pre-flop before the flop. So yeah, let's get into it basically. I've got a bit of a hoarse voice today as you can probably tell. I don't know if that sounds like, I don't know, people say that hoarse voices are sexy or whatnot. Maybe this is just kind of irritating since you'll all just be dudes listening to this like, God, why does this guy keep talking? So yeah, I'm going to drink my hot, hot black currant um, juice and hopefully I'll make it through the podcast because I've got a video to make after this as well. So yeah, such is the life of the poker dude. Anyway, deep stacks. So the first thing to say about deep stacks is that they equal more implied odds. We're all familiar with the concept of implied odds right now, the ratio of how much hero has to invest on one street to his potential gain on the next street that comes not from the pot as it stands, but from future bets from that cooperative villain stack because he wants to pay us off when we make our hand in case we're bluffing because they always think that you might be bluffing so we always have implied odds. Well, that's not true, but usually there's some percentage of the time that villain is going to call you down on later streets when you get there and that percentage of the time um, multiplied by the actual bets that you're going to make are going to determine how much you actually are going to get paid off by and that compared to your investment on the first street usually pre-flop is going to determine your implied odds so pre-flop we have a lot of implied odds deep because there's more money to make from villain stacks so when we get there it's easier to you know, raise the flop, pot the turn, pot the river and get all the stacks in. There are limits to this against most players. Um, I'd say that against like really aggressive players, there are less limits to just how much you can actually get in after the flop because these players are very cooperative and they will sometimes, you know, ag aggro fish like the one we're going to see in the hand to follow will sometimes cooperate to the extent that they'll like three bet the flop with top pair and then call a four bet on the flop and you can literally get like four or five hundred BBs in, in the hand. But these players are kind of, you know, rare. Most regs will go into a more defensive mode where they don't have a three betting range on the flop versus your flop raises. And so when you mine them pre-flop with your small pocket pair or whatnot, you can expect there to be a cap about, you know, of, as to how much you can win. It's not going to be much over 200 big blinds usually, but there are exceptions. Anyway, the hand we're going to look at here, um, we're going to consider the difference between being 100 BBs deep and being 200 BBs deep, which is, I guess, your standard kind of ballpark amount that people think about when they think about being deep. It's being double the effective normal stack in a cash game of 100 BBs, so 200 BB stack. Um... Hand 138 then is a spot where heroes in the cutoff and an aggro fish who runs 3618 um, opens from under the gun. Now, this villain is like, you might wonder, like 3618, it doesn't sound all that aggro. It is still aggro. If you think about a taggy player who's a reg who would run like 2118, then you're basically, you've got the aggression just from that 18 PF. It's not a small PF stat. And then you've got a 36 VPIP, which shows that this guy calls too much, limps and stuff. He's definitely a fish. Yes, he's more of the kind of aggro fish that will like, like to have the initiative more than just limp call then go berserk. But definitely aggro fish would be the better description of this guy than passive fish would. His full to 3 bet stat is 10% and his full to C bet stat is 25%. So both of those things just give you a good flavour of the guy's poker personality. He's clearly never folding to 3 bets at all, just always wanting to see the next street. 
and not really falling to the C-bets either. This guy, I would not be surprised if, given the lower gap between his VP, IP and his PFR, and those stats, if he had a considerable raising range on the flop for no good reason. So what that means is that when Hero looks down at his 8-6 of clubs in the cutoff, like he has here, he can expect in position, remember your implied odds are always better in position, because you can A, control that money goes into the pot, and B, um, make raises in position, and then raise the next street villain likes to dunk again all kinds of different stuff that you can do you can always ensure that money goes in you can always ensure that more money goes in when you're in position so hero's feeling pretty good about life here in the cutoff he would normally fold this hand 100 bbs deep because well there's a limit to what he can win from this fish and players behind are more likely to three bet with that stack depth and i think that when you're 200 bbs deep things change a little bit because you can expect to win a lot more money from the fish if in lines where the fish does things like he c bets flop hero raises and the fish three bets with the intent intention of not folding you're just going to make so much more money in those lines and if hero sizes correctly he could even like raise a pot size c bet large and then end up betting and jamming river or betting turn and river for way more than 100 big blind stack would allow so there are branches in the tree of ev which is always what we're thinking about the overall ev tree is poker players in which Hero can make a lot more money due to the stack size. Um, it's also the case that given the deep stacks, we're going to get multi-way pots here, which is a good and a bad thing. It's good in the sense that when Hero flops that gin straight, there's more people in the pot to pay him off, so implied odds do improve multi-way. But there are some reverse implied odds here um, as well, but hopefully it's the case that Hero's 200 BBs deep with the aggro fish, but not deep with like the reg on the button who might call behind him. That's what Hero would prefer, just to be deep in position to the aggro fish, the weaker player, and not so much to a stronger player. Um, that would be the most optimal kind of run out for this hand, or table conditions for this hand. So we're going to go ahead and call 8-6 suited on the cutoff to the 3x fish open, and be okay if people come along behind us. So that's the first hand. We don't get to see the flop because... Um, we're not even going to talk about that. We're just going to say that this is very much a call 200 BB steep, but would be very questionable 100 BB steep. Um, depends who's behind, you know. If you if you have like three very active squeezers or even two, or you just think that the pot's going to get three bet a lot, you might have to fold 8-6 suited here, regardless of how good the implied odds are, because the presence of squeezers behind you is going to affect you in a multitude of ways. It's going to... It's going to mean that, first of all, you don't get as many of those flatted, like, multi-way pots you kind of want with 8-6. And it's also going to mean that there's just a percentage of the time when Hero calls and doesn't get to see the flop. Now, that really hurts implied odds because what Hero needs in order to realise implied odds is a certain percentage of the time that he makes a big hand. Now, that percentage of the time that Hero flops a big hand is slashed dramatically if 30% of the time, that's quite extreme, but let's just use that as an example, if 30% of the time Hero does not get to see the flop because someone squeezes five times and he has to fold. Because when sque someone squeezes five times, Hero's implied odds suffer. But is it not just the same percent chance? Is that not good? Like, surely if someone's squeezing five times, they have a really strong range, right? Can Hero not just mine against that and expect to make even more money if he gets there? Well, yes, his payout is going to, on average, be higher against a really strong range, especially when the fish comes along, but the problem is that implied odds is not just as it's commonly mistaken to be the amount of money you think you can win, it's the ratio of the amount you invest to the amount you think you can win. And when you're forced to invest 15 big blinds, there's just no way that you're going to be able to recoup enough given how rarely you flop something great with 8-6 suited. Make no mistake, we're not flatting 8-6 suited because we think that it flops, it has frequent strength that it flops a big hand frequently. We're flatting it because we think those rarer times when it does connect very hard, uh, two pair plus for example, that <clears throat> we're going to be able to go ahead and extract a lot of value when that is the case. It's more about the amount we win when we do get there, not how often we get there. Although we do need to get there some meaningful amount of the time. If we get squeezed, that goes down, implied odds drop. So this call is conditional on there not being really aggressive active regs behind us. Let's take another example then. We have pocket fours now and heroes in the cutoff. We are hero. Um, under the unfolds, hijack folds, and we raise to 2.5x from the cutoff, 2.5 BBs. Small blind raises to nine big blinds. Action to hero. So small blind is a reg running 23, 17, 8. Now, this is basically the, the kind of situation where implied odds are not great because small blind is a reg. Most people three bet kind of linear, strongish range from the small blind, but it will have weaker hands that aren't going to be stacking off all the time. It's not anywhere near as tight as like jacks plus ace king. It's going to be way more than those top 40 combos. It's going to be pretty wide actually. Um, maybe something like 10 9 suited plus suited connectors, suited aces plus um, good broadways like king jack off plus 
all suited broadways. It could be something like that. If it's a linear range, it doesn't flat at all. It just always three bets or folds, being in the small blind. So heroes and played odds are not amazing here against that range. Um, he does have position, but usually pocket four is at 100 big blind stack depth. When he faces this, he's having to call off another seven, uh, sorry, 6.5 BBs after raising 2.5 BBs. Here is going to be folding fours here, 100 big blind stack depth. It's mandatory. You just cannot mine with fours here. However, when you're 200 BBs deep, suddenly... Your investment is the same as it was before, but now when you stack Villain, you can actually do it for 200 big. So if Villain has aces and decides not to fold post-flop because he doesn't like folding or whatnot, even deep, and the flop comes out king 4-3 and he starts betting away, you can actually, like, instead of just calling three streets until you're all in, which is what's going to happen 100 BBs deep, you can raise at some point in the hand. Usually the river, I guess, to keep your range kind of balanced, but that river raise that you can make and make, like, a big river raise, you know, you could be making like an additional 80, 90 BBs by raising that river if the pot's huge. That's enormous to your EV, even if you only get called like a third of the time, that still adds so much in the way of implied odds. When we fold fours here, it's not that we think it's a terrible, terrible call with 100 BB stacks, it's that we think it's like just not good, it's not, it's going to be minus EV. That doesn't mean it's going to be like losing absolutely tons of money. A lot of these spots in poker are quite close to zero EV, um, even if they are clear folds, it's not because they lose us like enormous amounts of that pre-flop investment they just loses a little bit of it so when we have that extra branch where we make all that money by raising at some point post-flop and getting more than 100 bbs from villain stack they can quickly swing into being a plus ev call pre-flop so with 100 bb stacks again hero should fold his hand like he should have in the last hand but with 200 bb stacks he should probably be looking to call and that's why actually another theme of this chapter later on is and um, when it comes to actually three betting with deep stacks um that three betting is actually just going to go way down in value it's going to make less ev when stacks are deep and the reason for that is that especially out of position because the in position opener who has the the range that contains lots of hands like mining hands like suited connectors good suited broadways and implied odds hands like pocket pairs is going to be able to make a lot of calls that are plus ev and so both three bet bluffs are going to go down in value because they lose fold equity because more hands are incentivized to call against them in position for implied odds and other reasons. Um, and also the play of position matters more deep. You have more opportunity to use it and exert that influence on the hand in an advantageous way. And where was I? So sec so that's one reason. Um, like post why you might want to Man, I'm like totally like losing my train of thought today. But yeah, basically, it comes down... Yeah, so getting back to what I was saying, when you're three betting out of position, firstly, yeah, it's bad because the positional advantage and the implied odds are increased. Um, but it's also just going to be bad to three bet there because, well, you kind of put, end up putting yourself in this scenario where you your hands that were like powerhouse hands, like aces, kings, queens, that raise it up and go bet, 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 these hands are either going to then be winning like a sizable pot or getting like completely stacked. So the worst case scenario with 100 BB stacks was that aces would lose you 100 BBs, but more frequently win you 100 BBs. Well now, due to something we call reverse implied odds, aces now on like low boards is going to either still win you the same 100 big blinds. If villain has like king queen on king 5-5 five five and decides to call down in a 3 bet pot against your aces, which you 3 bet pre-flop, then your aces are still going to only extract like 100 BBs. You still don't really have the stack to pot ratio available to get 200 BBs in there, although admittedly you can bet bigger than in the 100 big blind example with that effective stack and get a bit more than 100 BBs into the pot. You're not generally going to be making all that much more money when you're ahead. However, when you're behind, if you're not going to be folding the top of your range, theoretically the top of your range loses more money. So the ratio of kind of risk and reward, like the good branches where you end up extracting value, are still kind of similar when you're 200 deep, but the bad branches where you end up actually losing the hand due to your opponent flopping a rare set or two pair or whatnot are much worse because of the 200 big blind stack and your opponent's position allowing him to be able to, to raise you after the flop there. So I guess I totally had like a kind of mind blank where I was like, what was I just talking about and why did I end up on that tangent? That kind of happens, I think, because I'm sick right now. My head is kind of like not working, not firing on full cylinders, so... Hopefully, it may just be getting old as well, like having the whole um, forgetfulness of short-term memory. Maybe doing like too many drugs earlier in life. Who knows? Could be anything. Not that I did any drugs earlier in life, of course. Right, so let's move on to another example now. Um, let's look at this hand. Hand 140. 
in the book, which will be, I think, the last hand that we'll talk about today. Um, so this is a spot where Hero is actually in the big blind. And this kind of enforces what I was saying before. We have a good player who we're going to describe as a winning reg who opens in the cutoff with stats of 26-21. He has a 45% fold to 3-bit stat and a 53% fold to C-bit stat. So he folds more post-flop than pre-flop, but he doesn't really like folding too much. And we are 250 BBs effective with this cutoff winning reg who opens the pot to three big blinds. Hero's in the big blind and Hero has Queen of Clubs, Queen of Spades. So with 100 BB stacks, our play is clear here. We three bet, it's part of our polarized, um, or probably linear actually, three bet range in this spot because the villain does continue an awful lot to three bets. We'd probably be three betting something to the effect of tens plus, um, king, queen suited, ace jack suited plus, ace queen off plus um, in this spot, like a linear kind of value range because villain doesn't really fold enough to three bets. Either that or we'd use a polarized range that's more value heavy depending on how much we think he four bets and how much we'd hate to get four bet when we have a hand like king queen suited for example. So there are different approaches we can go here. We can go value heavy polar or we can go linear. Normally I'd default to linear but anyway so usually queens would be a very comfortable three bet shove over a four bet part of that. It has good equity when it does get in against villain's four bet call range. Villain could conceivably be four bet calling hands like ace queen suited or jacks which we did very well against and yeah it's just a no brainer to protect our three bet fold range to shove queens. It's high up it's high enough up there. The problem is that when we're 200 BBs deep that shove suddenly goes out the window. We can't shove over a like 17 BB 4 bet for 200 big blinds. The risk to reward there is terrible. Like you'll pick up a smallish pot or get stacked by kings or aces and lose a hell of a lot of money. So again, reverse implied odds. The branch of when it goes well for you is no better than it is 100 BB steep, but the branch where it goes badly for you is much worse, and that is the staple, the core of reverse implied odds. So what this means is that having any kind of 3-bet range here is actually bad, theoretically. And that sounds weird. Like, surely we do want to 3-bet because villain calls a lot. Well, villain's tendency to call a lot of our three bets is actually not something that's going to serve as a disadvantage for Villain in this case due to stack depth with 250 BB steep. So when Villain flats the cutoff with all of his like suited connectors, pairs, ASEX suited, he's got sizable equity with a lot of these hands anyway, or he's got good implied odds if he doesn't have good equity, and he's got position. So we're going to find that we're having to play pot control in like a massive pot or a pot big enough to threaten our 200 BB stack, and that is the problem. When we 3-bet pre, we create a pot that's big enough to generate those reverse implied odds. If we keep the pot nice and small, it's not much worse for us, the branches where we lose than it is in 100 BB stack depth, because the most we can lose is whatever we limit our kind of play to. So given we have a hand that's usually not going to flop nutted stuff, it's just going to flop like an overpair, um, we kind of want to protect against that member out of position. So I'm going to recommend that Hero does not have a 3-bet range in this situation, calls his whole range, and as a result calls queens. Like, you can 3-bet aces, that's not quite as bad, but even then there's still a lot of reverse implied odds where, you know, the branch where you do well, you're still winning like 100 bigs or something and you're getting stacked for 200 when you don't. So you need to be a bit careful here, and if you go into... You could say, well, characters, why can't we just fold pre-flop, uh, post-flop? If villain shows aggression, why do we have to be calling stations? Well... Do you know that villain doesn't bluff? Because if not, then all you're doing is opening yourself up to perhaps being exploited. So overall, I just don't think it's the best balance strategy here to have a 3-bet range. I think we should flat everything we're going to play. Small blind versus cutoff with this unfortunate stack depth for the 3-better and for being out of position. So stack depth is good for the opener. Deep stacks are good for the opener and good for the person in position. And they're bad for the would-be 3-better or the person out of position. So... I don't recommend that we have no 3-bet range in position, because that's fine, we're able to pot control much better there, make sure the pot doesn't get out of hand, villain won't always have the opportunity to inject money into the pot at every decision point. Um, so in position I think it's okay to have a 3-bet range, but out of position I'd be very wary against solid players. Now if villain is like a bad fish, like a passive or aggro fish, or any kind of fish really, 3-bet and queens here is fine, because he's going to make enough mistakes stacking off with bad hands, that the times that we end up getting bludgeoned to death by a set are going to be, excuse the kind of overboard violent imagery there, but they're going to be negated and we're still going to be getting enough value by building that nice big pot and we'll be losing enough value, moreover losing value if we don't 3-bet there that we should 3-bet against the fish, but against solid regs, regs who you don't have a good read of how badly they play and how you exploit those mistakes, you want to be very careful about even 3-betting anything when you're out of position with these kind of static sizes.
So we'll go ahead and call the three big blind open there and be pretty satisfied with that. So that's a taster of chapter 14 on deep stack play. The chapter then moves into playing shallow preflop and what it means to have stack sizes like 10 to 20 big blinds effective, 40 effective, or that pesky stack of 60 to 80 effective where you feel like you can't quite 4-bet bluff without shoving, but you don't want to 4-bet as you shove. How do you deal with that spot? That's all described in there. Um, how to deal with short stacks, who are shoving preflop, those annoying players, all that kind of stuff. A bit of math in the EV of a preflop shove, and then we move into postflop. What changes postflop deep, and how should we play the flop and the turn in the river differently? And also, how we play shallow stacked postflop, what it changes to our lines, gives us more opportunity to slow play sometimes. Sometimes means we have to stack off and value bet very thinly indeed. There are a lot of different things that, that happen post-flop due to stack size as well. So I dedicated the final chapter about stack size mainly because I kind of ignored it throughout the rest of the manual. Like I've touched upon it at certain points but not in much detail because I wanted to teach you guys throughout the first 13 chapters how we play with the typical 100 big blind stack depth that you're going to see in No Limit Hold'em. Like I said, I do use different stack -like examples to teach other points earlier in the manual, but the Grinders manual does not deal with stack size until chapter 14 where it deals with it very heavily and in a way that should prepare you for those exceptional non-standard stacks that I think it is finally worth saying in this podcast that you should get comfortable with deep stack play, that you can avoid it, sure you can leave the table when you become like over 150 BB effective, but the problem is what if there's a fish who's 200 effective with you and you're in position and you really want to play with them? but there's also a reg at the table who you need to know how to play against as well. There are many times you need to know how to deal with these awkward stack sizes so that you don't end up just playing your 100 BB game and making a lot of theoretical mistakes because there are a lot of lucrative situations in which you want to be playing in games with these stack sizes. So I'll leave you with that thought. It's always worth learning how to play deep, even if you avoid a lot of unfavorable deep spots as you should, like being out of position to a reg who's good deep. You should avoid that, but there are many that you don't want to avoid, so do work on your deep stack game. All right, this has been Characters for the Carrot Poker Podcast, and I will be coming at you with another update in the next week or two. I'll be doing a special lunch party kind of podcast when the book comes out and giving you guys some more sneak previews and trying to encourage you to purchase it. So stay tuned for that as well. And in the meantime, please get in touch as you have been doing, leaving me some feedback, comments, questions. I'll get back to every single one of you who emails me. Um, with any kind of feedback, questions, coaching requests, I am still taking on students and will be taking on even, will have even more time to dedicate to coaching when the book comes out. So it's a good time to hire me in the next sort of three weeks. Um, I, was, I am still teaching now, but two or three weeks from now, I will be happy to, you know, dedicate even more time to the, my students between sessions than I'm perhaps able to do right now. So admin at Carrot Corner is how to get a hold of me for that and visit CarrotCorner.com if you want any information on coaching packages, pricing or anything of that nature. So see you guys on the next one and until then, good luck at the tables. <laughs>